comparing means specifically for two groups. Uh, this is very much like comparing proportions for two groups. Uh, for the most part, really the only difference is going to be replacing p's for proportions with mu's for means. And much of the same thing we talked about before is going to carry forward. So I'm going to try to move a little bit quicker through this to give us maybe a shorter video this week than the last few. Um, so we'll do hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. Then we'll do an example in R and we'll practice with a little bit of dplyr um, because dplyr is an incredibly useful tool in the world of R and statistics. And I think the more practice with you with it you can get, the better. So let's just close that one out and start a new slide. We're going to do hypothesis tests. for two means first. So we've got a null hypothesis in the world of hypothesis testing. And for the case of comparing two means, we want to ask if the mean for group one is equal to the mean for group two. And in a similar way we have for proportions, this equality implicitly implies that the, whoops, that the difference is equal to zero. And that's kind of how we create like one test statistic out of two uh, population, two sample means. We'll contrast the null hypothesis with the alternative that they are not equal. And following good scientific practice, we'll specify our level of significance up front. Now, in a similar way, again, just continuing forward with our difference of two proportions, here, our difference of two means is going to allow us to create a test statistic, T, where we estimate the difference of the two means, subtract off the null hypothesis, and divide by an appropriate standard error. That standard error calculation is actually fairly difficult to do, so we are going to avoid it. Eh. It's no more difficult than it is for the two proportions case, but nonetheless, I don't think we need to dive into the details of this. We are going to let R figure out how to do this test for us, so long as we can write the appropriate code. But I'll tell you what, the degrees of freedom for this test are quite difficult to calculate. There's some ways to kind of cheat it, and those are easy enough to figure out but we're going to let R do all of the calculations for us and maintain our same interpretations in the end. When the p-value is low, reject HO. And when it's not, don't. So that's all I'm really going to say for hypothesis testing for two means. I will save the rest of what I might have to say um, for an example in R. So next up is going to be confidence intervals. For the difference. Of. Two means. And really we're going to focus on the difference of two means for the same reason that we did for proportions in this way we can create one confidence interval for it. So the formula looks largely the same, just replace the p's with mu's. We start by making a best guess of the thing of interest. That is the difference of the two means. Then we add and subtract some number of standard errors, where the standard error is actually the exact same calculation we have for hypothesis tests of two means. But again, we will just let R do that calculation for us. And same with the degrees of freedom. Now, I want to just reiterate what it is we're looking at in the world of confidence intervals for the difference of two means, whether they be proportions or actual means that are not proportions. Largely, we're interested in if the confidence interval is strictly negative, that is both the lower bound and upper bound of the confidence interval is negative, then we have evidence that mu2 is greater than mu1. Because if the confidence interval is strictly negative, 
then by subtracting off the bigger term, mu hat 2, this entire interval will be negative, so long as mu hat 2 is uh, sufficiently bigger than mu hat 1. And alternatively, if the confidence interval is strictly positive, then we have evidence that mu hat 1 is greater than mu hat 2. For the same sort of reason, mu hat 1 will be the sufficiently bigger term in the scenario that the confidence interval is strictly positive. Now, there's a final scenario that we need to consider, which consists of the interval including the value 0. When the interval includes the value 0, all that we can really conclude is that mu hat 1 is approximately equal to mu hat 2, or they're at least within estimation error. I rarely believe that two population parameters are identically equal for most scenarios out there. Sure, you could probably create a scenario where you really think hard about what it would take to make two population parameters being identically the same number. But for the most part, in realistic scenarios, I don't believe two population parameters are ever going to be the exact same number. But you might end up with scenarios where zero is within a confidence interval, and you're not really sure what to conclude. The basic conclusion would be, we don't have sufficient evidence to separate out these values. So those are going to be the three scenarios we're going to be interested in for confidence intervals. Either they're strictly negative, strictly positive, or include the number zero in the interval somewhere. So that was all I'm going to say about hypothesis tests and confidence intervals in general. We're going to jump into R and do a specific example. I'm going to come over here to my GitHub repository named data. We've looked at the data set Carnivora before, so I'm just going to immediately go get the appropriate link for this data set by clicking on the button raw in the CSV file. I will copy the URL with Command C on a Mac or Control C on a Windows machine. I'm going to name the data set appropriately and read it in as such. Now, I'm going to encourage us to load the libraries ggplot2 and dplyr, because I want us to work with both in this video. I'm always going to recommend to you, step one, plot your data. So we're going to use the data frame we just read in, Carnivora. I'm going to put super family on the x-axis. I'm going to do that because I know super family has only two levels in it. Dog-like things, Caniformia, or cat-like things, Theliformia. And remember, this is a video about comparing means for two groups. So my two groups are going to be dog-like and cat-like things. And I'm going to look at the variable FW, which stands for female body weights measured in kilograms for animals from these two families. I'm going to add to it the geometry of jitter. If you recall, I recommend um, adding some noise, horizontal noise, when you have are trying to make something like a scatter plot, but the x-axis is categorical. I'm going to specify a width so there's not too much noise added to the plot, and let's just stop there and see what we have. OK, so here's our data set. Here is dog-like things with two possibly really big dog-like things. And here are um, cats. Yeah, there's two medium-sized cats. And that's fine. But my question right now is, what are those things? Anyway, OK, we're going to move on for now. I'll come back to those big things in a minute. 
Um, I'm going to add a layer to this. I'm going to see if we can use a similar sort of tool that we did for proportions. Because it would be super nice if we could use this um, mean confidence limits under the normal distribution because of the central limit theorem. If we could use this functionality to just put up means and confidence intervals on this plot immediately for us. And if you let my computer, you know, do its thing. Okay, so there is an extra point up here. Look at this. This is a mean of female body weights for dog-like things right there. And this is the mean for cat-like things for female body weights. And the bars extending up and down from these points are the 95% confidence intervals. Those are just kind of chosen for you by default. So that's really informative plot, but it's kind of hard to see those. So is there anything we can do? Like, let's try shading the points in the background to see if that emphasizes the means and the confidence intervals a little bit better. Oh, I like that much more. But look, I've shaded the points, and so now they're kind of blending into the background. So you know what? I'm going to show you all my preferred theme for ggplot. Minimal is my preferred theme mainly just because it takes ink off the page. Excess ink is just distracting to the eye, and I don't think we need it. Okay, maybe my shading was a little bit too serious, and I want to shade just something a little bit less. Hey, now that's not bad. Now, hmm. Let's see if there's anything else we can do. I'm going to add an aesthetic to this stat summary layer. I'm just going to color these by the variable super family. And you know what? For our colorblind males, let's add shapes by super family too. Just in case somebody can't see the colors that are chosen, we can add another visual cue to differentiate the means. Okay, still waiting for my computer to think. It apparently needs to think hard about all this. Okay, that's quite interesting. So now we have caniformia in this pinkish color and feliformia, oh, caniformia in the pinkish color with a circle and feliformia in this turquoise color with a triangle. That's great. Those visual cues really help our audience understand our plot. So here's our mean, our 95% confidence interval, and a mean and a 95% confidence interval, and the points shaded in the background, but also jittered so that they don't show up in just a solid column. Okay. So coming back to these two, let's see if we can use the library dplyr to figure out what these two values are. So we're going to go... Our data set is named carnivora. And then let's just do a quick filter with fw greater than. Now remember, dplyr's function filter keeps observations. So what we're interested in here, if we want to identify just these two, is observations greater than 200. Now, I don't actually care if you pick 200 or 250 or 150. Any number in that range is going to work. If you see what we have here, we have a new data frame with only the rows where FW is greater than 200. And what we get out is the family Ursidae. I don't know if you know the family Ursidae. It's bears. So strictly as an educational practice here, I'm going to exclude the bears and then make this plot again. So this is like pretending you're on the continent Africa and you only want to look at animals that might live on Africa. So you'd be like, family is not equal to Ursidae. And you could have done this with FW just the same. Oh, that's way too much printing. You know what I should have done here? It's created a new data frame, new bears. No bears, not new bears, no bears. So now we have a data frame that dropped four observations. 
So it looked like not only were these two bears, but some of the other observations were also bears. So with our new data set, no bears, look what we can do. I'm just going to change carnivora to the data frame, no bears. And it's going to drop these two plus two other observations. And I think the results we're going to get out are going to be fairly informative. Once my computer does its thing, I wonder what's going on right now. Oh man, look at that. As soon as we dropped bears, it's actually like the means reversed between the dog-like and the cat-like things. Look at this. You can go back just one plot. And so here's the plot with the bears near 300 kilograms. And indeed, caniformia looks slightly, the mean for caniformia looks slightly bigger than the mean for feliformia. But when you plot just the same data set without the bears, then it looks like the mean for feliformia is relatively higher than the mean for caniformia. Now, what we can do with what we're going to learn in this video is figure out how to formally test the difference between these means, feliformia and caniformia. And we're going to do it strictly for the scenario where we have excluded bears for whatever reason that you might do that. So in R, there is a function named t.test. And into t.test goes this weird formula-like syntax. You start with the numeric variable of interest and then put in a tilde. That character right there is named tilde, T-I-L-D-E. Some people say tilde. I don't really know which one it is. You find that character by holding shift and pressing the button to the left of one. Hold shift and press the button to the left of one. So you go numeric variable, tilde, which should be read as, as explained by superfamily. So we're going to try to predict the response variable, female body weight, as explained by the categorical explanatory variable, superfamily. And then you specify the data set you're going to use. And in this case, let's use the data frame, no bears. So here is our test statistic, T, with degrees of freedom, which, yes, they can be decimal placed values. And indeed, they are in this scenario, although it's kind of strange to think about. And a p-value that is testing the following hypothesis, mu of caniformia equal to mu whoops, of feliformia against the alternative. Look, um, the alternative hypothesis is the true difference of means is not equal to zero. So you know we should probably write our difference like that. And it defaults to a level of significance of alpha equal to 0 0.5, 0 0.05. So we have a p-value of 0.12. OK, so remember your phrase. When the p-value is low, reject HO. Is our p-value lower than your level of significance? It is not. So in this case, you fail to reject HO. This seems like the more likely uh, hypothesis between these two. It appears that there is not sufficient data to indicate that these two points are different. There is insufficient data to indicate that these means are different. So in fact, it's more likely that they're the same. Now we don't want to claim they're exactly the same, and we certainly don't want to claim that we've just proven they're exactly the same. All we can say at this point is there is insufficient evidence to indicate that the two means of female body weights between caniformia and feliformia are different, OK? And look at this down here. Here is our 95% confidence interval of the difference. Notice 
that there's a very particular number within that interval, the value zero is contained in the interval, which gives us evidence of the same conclusion we just had with the hypothesis in this scenario. There is insufficient evidence to claim that they're different because zero is somewhere in that interval. Because zero is somewhere in that interval, we can't say if the difference between these two means is significant. Okay, that's pretty informative for us. So I hope you all will come to like the function t.test in R. I think the hardest part about it is this new syntax, which I'm introducing here for the first time and we will use for almost the entire rest of the semester. You start with your numerical response variable, whatever's on the y-axis of interest. And you want to explain that numerical response variable by some explanatory variable. In the world of confidence intervals and hypothesis for two means, what's giving us the two different groups in order to have two different means is a categorical explanatory variable that specifically has two levels. So here, our explanatory variable will be categorical with two levels in particular, and that's for the function t.test. So the last thing I'm going to show you how to do is a little bit more uh, dplyr work so you can figure out how to recover these confidence intervals yourself. Sometimes it's helpful to know what those exact values are even after R plots them for you. So let's start with our data set, no bears, and then group by. Now, you should pause the video at this point. What are we going to group by in order to get these two different groups means? OK, here comes the answer. Superfamily. We're going to group by superfamily and then summarize to calculate means of FW, the response variable, female body weight. So we want things in order to calculate confidence intervals. We want things like the mean. We want the sample size. You should be careful here that you don't have any missing data, but that's a quick check. You can go, is there any not, uh, is there any NAs in no bears dollar sign FW? Okay, so there is no NAs in dollar sign FW. So we can use the function little n to extract the sample size for each group of the levels of the categorical variable superfamily. We're also going to want estimates for each group of the standard deviation. We're going to want a standard error. I'm going to let you figure out how to do that one. We're going to want t star. I'll help you with this one because it's a little bit different than before when you're doing it within the function summarize. In this case, you've got to do each upper and lower confidence interval by itself. Because of that, we're only going to ask for the upper quantile. And then I'll show you how to deal with it. So what I'm going to ask you to do in your course notes is fill in these ellipses, these three dots right here. I want you to fill in the calculation for the standard error. It's just like we saw before for each level of superfamilies confidence interval. So for each level, you're back to a single mean. And you should pull up your notes for single mean confidence interval. So you put the calculation for the standard error right there. And then you're also going to put the calculation for just the upper bound right here. Now remember to create a confidence interval. We add to get the upper bound and subtract to get the lower bound some amount in order to establish this range. So I'm going to let you fill in in your course notes what you need using the variables I've provided for you, what you need to add to get the upper bound and then fill in what you need, and in this time, subtract the appropriate thing to get the lower bound. 
And this code here will recover for you the two confidence intervals you're looking at right here. Now, if you want to zoom in on these confidence intervals a little bit, here's a good trick. Go up to your plot above and just put a hashtag in front of the jitter line and then rerun that line of code. And it will essentially zoom in to the confidence intervals by excluding the layer that specifies the points themselves. And in this way, you should be able to identify better what these bounds of your confidence intervals are in order to check your work as you go. OK, so this video gives us, I'm going to argue, not a ton of code, but certainly some, where we used the library ggplot to make a plot that highlights for us the comparison of two means of some numerical variable across the levels of a categorical explanatory variable. We learned the code in R to get out a hypothesis test for the difference of two means. And the same code will also give us a confidence interval for the difference of two means. So this is really handy code right here. This shows up a lot in the world of applied statistics, which is why I'm asking you to focus on this for your course notes. And in fact, you have a report two is going to base, be based solely on a difference of two means, whether they be means or proportions. And then down here at the end, we're starting to use dplyr to recover some of the statistics we looked at earlier in this semester. So really, I'm just trying to build on our experience with the library dplyr here. I'd like you to add this highlighted piece to your course notes for some variable you pick from the data frame carnivora, where you fill in these dots here.